Can it be that a lack of courage is one of the main obstacles that we have in the process of transcending modernism and recover the beauty of arts and architecture and in the different areas where beauty would be so enriching for us? In today's episode, we will dive deeper down into this topic and also look at the metaphysical perspective that we need to keep in mind for how to uh, deepen an appreciation of classical music and the classical disciplines in general, but also on how to bring about a revival in this generation. So let's tune in. The world in the West has become increasingly ugly. People are increasingly depressed and big movements all over the world are now telling modernism enough is enough. Join us on this podcast as we unite these voices and together recover the beauty of art, music, and architecture to uncover its significance for environmental stewardship, mental health, moral goodness, objective truth, and a vital spiritual life. My name is Magnus Gautestad, and this is Beauty and the Faith. Greetings and wake up. I am so grateful to be together with Martin Romberg, uh, a fellow Norwegian and musician. Martin, how are you today? I am good. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on your show, Magnus. Looking forward to this. Yeah, wonderful. As we usually like to do here, we're just going to jump into a quick uh, introduction and then we're going to get into action. Martin Romberg was born in Oslo in 1978. He is a graduated composer from the University of Music in Vienna, where he studied classical composition with Michael Jarrell and film music with Klaus Peter Sattler. Since the beginning of the 2000s, Romberg has worked extensively as an international level composer, arranger, conductor, and writer. His music, which is described as ethereal, metaphysical, and neo-romantic, has been performed by more than 40 orchestras worldwide. Currently, he is also music director of the Rose Castle outside Oslo in Norway. So, so happy to be with you here, Martin. We're going to start with a question we like to challenge all our uh, 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 speakers here at the show with, and that is, what would more beauty in the world lead to? Oh, only good things. I think that if we remember back, or I believe that I'm a metaphysical, so I, I believe that we carry memory of humanity with us. Even if we were not, we haven't lived for 2000 years, we carry 2000 years with us. So I, I think that what we can try to do if we concentrate is to remember something about our own past, and I'm talking about our own civilization's past. Let's try to remember back to those times where things were actually beautiful or where beauty was um, a constitutional part of society, like, for example, Greece, or like, uh, you know, the big European capitals in the 19th century, or in the Renaissance Italy. Imagine the the life and the uh, um, liveliness of those civilizations and what they actually produced and what very few people produced in a very short amount of time. People were amazingly productive in these times. I mean, uh, look at composers between the, the 15th and the 19th century. They actually they wrote thousands of works during their short lifespans. Now, that must be... Um, testimony of a, an extremely er energetic culture. So I, I think that the first thing that beauty would provide us is the will to live, the will to act and the will to create and the will to inspire ourselves and others. I'm not talking about happiness because happiness is just a consequence of all these things. Um, but if you look at the present society where energy is a it's a major issue. I, I'm very interested in that subject, energy in general, because when I see people that have love, love energy or civilizations which have love energy, there is always some, a cause. And, uh, and this cause is, I suspect, um, related to 
the, the sense of meaning or not. If, if you have the feeling of living a meaningless life in a meaningless place, which is not providing you anything by itself, uh, then your natural psychological energy levels will go down. And this is a major issue today. I think uh, a lot of people feel apathy, not only with the political situation, but also with aesthetics. And we as artists could at least provide uh, an aesthetical framework that could encourage and pull up those energy volumes, which we desperately need. And we remember, if you look back at history, in ourselves, we don't need to read a history book because you have this memory in you. Um, and you remember what that used to be like in some civilizations, then that's what might be achieved. I think you're bringing a very important uh, point to the discussion that we have about this. Uh, you're including uh, meaning and you're also including uh, fruits of uh, kind of a, a zest or, or a purpose and amazing productivity and creativity. And that beauty, when, when, when you have beauty in our surroundings and beauty as a standard, it, it brings people a, a purpose and a meaning and, and it, a, it makes people better. It, it elevates people in a way. Uh, so it's a very in, inspiring factor uh, of beauty. And so more beauty in the world would actually then lead to, to more people having a sense of meaning, a sense of direction, uh, develop their creativity. Uh, am I understanding you correctly? Or you had more points, but that was some of the things that stuck to me. Yes, obviously. Uh, I think that it's um, it's like a bacteri bacterial culture. Um, sorry, I have to close down an email program here. No problem. Um, well, just leave it. Um, it's like, you know, humanity is like, we're not bacteria, but we, we are a collective. And obviously, if um, it's like your digestion system, right? If you have good bacteria, then the good bacteria promote other good bacteria, and you have to have bad ones, then they promote other bad bacteria. So it's a you know it's a self-propelling and self-repeating um, uh, logic which in within environments. If it's a human environment or a bacterial environment, it's pretty much the same. So obviously, if somebody you know it's like a village. We live in a small French village, and um, I, I I started you know putting in a very nice entrance door. Uh, in our house, and people were actually flocking around the entrance door. Like, tourists started taking pictures of it, and and all of a sudden, you know, other people uh, started putting in nice entrance doors as well. Like when when you you have you just have to instigate something, and and people say, "Well, this is fantastic. I I can f find the confidence to do the same thing now." So it's about inspiration, but also to give people confidence that they actually have the right to do something beautiful. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, problems connected to uh, the historical usage of beauty. So in the older days, in the 19th century, of course, the upper class, the bourgeoisie, kings and queens, they put a lot of money into beauty. So beauty became a symbol of elitism and royalty and finally oppression because if if a king uses you know billions of dollars on a castle and the people starve, you know it's a classical example. Um, people would start to connect beauty with oppression, uh, and that's a, a political problem. Uh, now, now the the bourgeoisie in the nineteenth century um, managed to uh, make beauty available for the middle class, uh, so that was very important. But still today, we have this prejudgment that some forms of beauty is an expression of extravagance. And, and, and that morally, some people think that's bad. It's, it's bad to be extravagant. It's bad to um, be the full version of yourself because you might disturb others. And so people's anxiety, it's very important to work with and understand with a lot of empathy and a lot of softness because... Uh, because these are true feelings as well. Uh, I, I think that our task as artists, you know, is to show people that this can be done and please don't be afraid of it. Put in that nice entrance door. It's going to feel better for the rest of your lives and your grandchildren will still see that nice door in 100 years. Whereas if you put in the, 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 the cheap door, 
from you know the, the local the whatever build store then then you know you're going to change it in 10 years anyway so it's a lot about courage these things because people they know mostly what beauty is by instinct mm. uh, so it's much more about trusting yourself mm. I, I hear i hear what you're saying and uh, we have actually had a we were talking about um the vanity or some would might say you know having i was talking with an antique dealer about is it vanity to have a lot of beautiful valuable material things in your surroundings is that a, sort of like something that makes you a worse person or you're trying to you know get attention to yourself but i think it really it depends on on uh, which mi- the mind that you have and where you're coming from there will be some people who who dress beautifully and have their house beautiful or their facade beautiful and that it's a sign of respect to the, your neighbors they will put flowers in the entrance not to say oh oh they think they are you know the the flower kings and queens here in the street you know and they would just say you know what i i, I see people smile when they see the flowers outside and there might be an old lady and they she want to make it as nice as possible and when she has guests over she put on a nice dress with ornaments and everything like that so there's a lot about where we are coming from and i think that um we, we, of course, infused in modernism, you would also have some of the the, the Marxist paradigms of, of oppressive and like you're saying, they have connected it to sort of an elitist thing of, you know, who do you think you are? You're trying to not be equal, you know, as the ultimate standard. But basically what you're saying here, Martin, is that there's a so- certain level of uh, fear there, or maybe some sort of dogma, modernist dogma there about not um, doing something beautiful that maybe sticks out. And if you actually have the courage to make something beautiful, uh, for example, me, I I like to wear suspenders or a tweed suit or something on the airport. And some people, sometimes people come over to me and just say, "Oh, you you dress really great," <laughs> and like uh, even though I'm I'm overdressed. Um, and and then might other people find that inspiring and and their spine gets erected too and say you know what i i think really deep down i always thought a tweed suit looks really really good you know i'm going to get that tweed suit even though it sticks out a little bit uh, and and you have to overcome some sort of uh, group pressure dynamics there and and find that courage in yourself so i think it's a very good point that you're saying here that actually more beauty in the world will also lead to more courageous people because it it requ- requires a certain amount of, of courage. And there's actually a very famous quote by uh, Balthasar that actually says that beauty uh, requires just as much courage as truth and goodness. Uh, so that's a very famous quote people can look up. Uh, we're going to progress this conversation uh, to more into classical music, something that was a pivotal uh, a, a turning point in my life, about my self-image, about my sense of meaning and appreciation of beauty in general, was when I trained my ear, was got more education around the classical tradition, and I got so fascinated about it. And it was like I woke up out of a dream, and I can remember that I was able to listen to more instruments at the same time that I wasn't able to before. Before, I only had to listen to maybe one or two. It couldn't be too complex or else it kind of be- just became like this magma of things. And I, it was only a feeling. But but through education, I was able to kind of focus on many things at one time. And then it was the richest thing. You know, I played in many rock bands, but nothing was more powerful now than classical music. It was like, this is the ultimate expression of progress. Uh, so maybe... It's not like that for everybody. And I want to ask you, Martin, what's your perspective? How can people deepen their appreciation of classical music? Well, it's a good question. I think that um, the solution to this is actually not, or perhaps not, because I don't have all the answers, but it might not be in the music itself. Um, yeah, it, well, it is, uh, because you need several things. You you need, um, in order to connect to um, a certain type of culture, you need living persons that are able to transmit this. So and that counts for composers uh, and musicians. Uh, these two categories of humans need to uh, be active, alive uh, today, uh, to be um, inspirational, uh, charismatic, to be true 
to be honest and to believe profoundly in what they try to transmit and to probably sacrifice a lot to get that high energy level uh, in order to um, you know transmit that so the trouble is that we have had a culture where well more than anything else composers have written very difficult music for the last hundred years um, so that has in a lot of ways eliminate the composer from the from the um, per performance uh, aspect of it so that's why you know musicians largely play old musician old music uh, which is nice very nice but um there is 50 percent lacking because you need to do something that is created now in order for it to vibrate really it's nice to go and hear the oslifer almonic play the fifth beat of symphony but imagine being in the concert hall when that was played for the first time or when you know they went on tour and beat even sat, sat there with them old and you know deaf and whatever he was um, imagine like that energy then you really feel to be part of something that is happening right now and and in order for anything to be popular uh, people have to um, feel that it's relevant for their lives and it's relevant for our times now the second thing is that classical music um, is a very anti-modern way of expressing yourself because it's very slow going and it's long pieces are long and uh, often unbearably long um you know and and we live in a in an era where attention span is really short i don't think attention span is that short as they try to convince us of because uh, i mean the, i think the latest research shows that people can't concentrate for more than four seconds which is more or less the same uh, level as a four-year-old um, <clears throat> child uh, but i don't think so but still uh, we live in this society where you know all pop songs were taken down to three minutes thirty, and and things should go fast and quickly, and we have, we scroll from one thing to another. So, of course, in that environment, it's a uh, uh, it's very counterintuitive to come with the symphony at the last forty minutes. Uh, so, the thing that will happen, I think, when when perhaps people find more peace in their lives, if we can create a society that that um, provides the possibility to slow down a little bit in your life, then automatically classical music will play a role because then that format, which is always long, that, that's long thoughts that you're expressing, you're presenting ideas and it develops, you're developing a drama. And the drama takes time to develop. You need a, an exposition, conflict resolution and so on. And all these things takes time. And, um, and you need a mindset that uh, is available to listen to something for more than three minutes, which means that we also need to work on the society part. Mm. Uh, actually, the art itself is is fine, but but I think I think that we, you know, as artists, today uh, are in a really interesting position because. We can't just work with the art. We have to do a lot of things to get at the same time, and 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 to work with philosophy and and the way of life, uh, and you know the current status of civilization is actually very interesting to work with. Uh, the Mozart didn't uh, need to worry about those things. He, he just popped into a you know a regular circuit where everything was defined for him. So so they said the you know Herr Mozart write a piano concerto for next Sunday. And uh, you know perfectly well what that meant, so like three movements and this, this and this and this. So the framework was already there. And another thing that um, to to close out that uh, line of thought, if you if you take that example of Mozart and um, about creating something new all the time, because they certainly did. So I don't know how many piano concertos he wrote. I, I think twenty six, seven. I, I can't really remember. It's something like that. And. Um, and he performed these piano concertos with an orchestra, and people generally thought it was fantastic. And they still asked him, well, Mr. Mozart, can't you write us another concert for next month? Even if that concert was fantastic, they didn't want to hear it again. So they, they preferred commissioning something new than to 
take up that piece of genius that that has already been performed. That tells us something about that society, about the vitality of that time. Mm. They were so full of confidence that even if they made uh, works of gen- uh, genius, well, it doesn't matter. I can be genius in three weeks as well. You know, so so they preferred, and, and that's a, a vibrating culture. When you obtain that level of self confidence, mm. then you are part of a vibrating culture, and mm. that includes creators presenting new stuff all the time, even if what you presented last week was a work of brilliance and genius. A society with confidence in itself will ask you to repeat your genius next week. That's that's very inspiring. I I can I can really sense my uh, my soul getting elevated here. I, something that I especially pay attention to is that um, to be able to appreciate classical music. Uh, is that we we do focus and encourage more the production of new classical music, new beautiful music, uh, because I think there is a sense, like you're saying, when you know you are part of making history, you, you don't know which of these pieces are going to be what they're listening to in 300 years. You know, there is a certain uh, untrendiness about classical music, which is exciting, which, you know, this, this can be a piece that will be solidified for a long time. And I, I am no part of uh, part of that, and uh, um, to really lift more people uh, um, up. Uh, we I know, for example, Alexander Blesinger. He is uh, Blesinger. He is uh, uh, making contests, for example, for this purpose, new beautiful music, uh, and and so to to put it in a nutshell here, classical music is challenging, uh, but it does make you better, uh, and I think it's very. People need that challenge, um, but within that uh, challenge to make it easier for people to appreciate it, we also need to work a bit more holistically on society, on people, so they will become more peaceful and they will have values so they understand being challenged is a good thing. Um, and finding enough peace to being able, just like they have in a movie, where they let the music develop into a longer story, that they're able to also have that uh, story being made in them while they're listening to music in real time without all the pictures and everything spoon fed sped to them, uh, especially when it comes to uh, instrumental uh, music. Uh, so I think that's a, a great point that you have added to the, the discussion here. We're going we're gonna, to uh, move uh, to the next question, uh, Martin. I, I can, you want can, to, can I just uh, comment something? Just yeah. put, put in a, just a last thought to that. Um, I was just thinking when I heard you speak now. Um, there is something um, which is quite interesting, which happened the last two, three years, um, mm. notably uh, because of the pandemics. You know that uh, the, the concert industry, if there, you can call it like that, um, have suffered immensely uh, from this uh, pandemic where, you know, as everybody knows, all concert halls were shut down and, and put to rest. And, and so a very few venues have manage to get the you know the audience numbers back up again to pre-pandemic levels um now what i think that is that um this is also a window of op- opportunity to redefine the concert situation and situ- uh, the, the method uh, with whom we bring music to people uh, you know that in the renaissance art uh, very often happened on the street uh, and I think I, I believe more and more in, well, perhaps two things. First, to bring art to people and not sit to wait that people come to the art. Mm. Uh, as a musician, it's quite simple because you can just go down on the street actually and, and play. And, and, and people used to do that over the most centuries. Um, this very formal, you know, expensive concert hall situations actually emerged during the classical and romantic eras. Uh, but before that, you know, music was a you know part of a living, thriving uh, culture outdoors. Uh, and so that's a very interesting material to work with. And the second material to work with to get the music to people, because I, I slightly disagree that uh, classical music, at least the simple parts of classical music are difficult to listen to. I don't 
think so. I might not be objective because I've done this all my life. So, but I, I, I think that the you know simple pieces by Bach and Mozart is actually quite easy to listen to. Hmm. Um, um, and so, so that would be a first method of bringing things to people. And the second thing would be to redefine this uh, rather boring and you know dusty concert situation. And it's, it's expensive as well, and you know who, who bothers anymore. So what we can try to figure out is to find settings. Uh, for example, in bars, why not? You know, uh, where where classical music can be played and people can drink beer at the same time. What I, what do I know? Or wine or whatever. H- having having feasts gatherings. You know, I read this article about the Renaissance. I mean, people were partying all the time. People like to drink all the time. Every day they, they went down to the tavern, they got drunk, people played music. You know, it was a vibrating, vital culture. And uh, and nobody, you know, asked for the musicians who just came. Uh, and uh, this once more, this is about courage, you know, like don't wait for people to call you and, and no, just go down to the street and do something. Mm. So that's what I wanted to say. You can, as a musician, uh, as a classical musician, you can be active in a much um, more uh, vivid way than than the, the pre-pandemic times, I think. I think it's a window of opportunity, actually. Mm. Well, I think that's uh, just some very great complementary thoughts. And uh, uh, even Peter Paul Rubens, one of the greatest painters in history, he said, my talents is such that no undertaking, however vast in size, has ever surpassed my courage. And I think it really comes back to some of what we're saying here now that um, it comes down to uh, an, a need for encouragement uh, of people uh, and to get to get that inspired and to go up to higher levels of, of energy and vibrancy as individuals and as society. And I think you have given some very concrete ways. And also, I like that you uh, you, you think a little, like a, a bit missional about uh, the, um, uh, the the music, that they actually um, get, go out of our bubbles of pure-minded pure, pure minded, uh, uh, friends and circles and and go out there into the streets and into people where many are in darkness where many are ignorant and um, and actually go out there in 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 love and actually uh, help them uh, go go out there go go among them right as a as a believer you know i look to jesus and he, you know he was criticized but he went out of his you know he, he stayed with his disciples and he, he he stayed also alone for a lot of time but then he went out and he sit among whoever in society and, and was among them. And that, that was a way he could really have an influence instead of him just sitting at one place where everybody had to come to him. He was there among people and, and was able to uh, reform many um, structures that way. Um, so we, let's go to the third question here now. And um, what would need to happen to have a revival of beautiful classical music? And, and where I mean a, a, a faster bloom of something within our generation, what would need to happen? Well, firstly, a little bit what we already talked about. Um, I think that examples must be made. You know, that most classical pieces of music that you know today were created in tiny environments. You know, Bach, he traveled from city to city within the German city-states and and took up a job here and took up a job there and and wrote, you know, the Brandenburg concertos for a you know small group of people, can't have been more than 30 people. You know, and they played it. Half of them were musicians. Uh, all of these pieces of works in um, emerged in tiny, tiny environments, but they were authentic environments. Um, and it must start somewhere. So what I suspect is that what people need firstly, artists, is an authentic environment. They first need to be authentic. That's the first point. Um, they, and they need an environment to thrive in. Uh, now, everybody can't be geniuses. Uh, and, and, but everybody has their place within an environment. And, and that, that place might be, you know, it might shift during our lifetime because a genius might turn stupid and a stupid person might turn a genius. That might happen during a lifetime because the human mystery... Um, is it really all about that? We, 
all you know statistical um uh, propositions on how a human being will be uh, always fails the human being always surprises us uh, there there's something miraculous you know going on if even if you come from a family where with you know two parents low iq you there, there still might be children born which have a really high iq uh, so these things are not deterministic and that's a part of the human miracle i think so my point is that these environments need to be very tolerant and and kind and uh, with a lot of hearts um because everybody should have a place in them um today there is a lot of competition going on you know we live in a competitive society and you know you, you look at social media and like everybody likes you know put their likes and hearts on everybody else's success but you know you know really inside you know they're all, oh god oh god he won a prize what about it? i haven't won a prize why he why did he do it and you know people have these kind of thoughts and we need to stop all that we need to you know to be happy for other people's success it's vital you can't be a single flower on a field it's not possible a field a nice field needs to consist of a lot of flowers and a lot of different flowers because they are operating good together this is the permacultural uh, you know the philosophy of uh, growing plants uh, you, you need a lot of plants and you need a lot of different plants in order for a uh, ecological system to work so th this is the first point I, th I think it's to go out of this profound loneliness that haunts the modern uh, man mm. uh, both you know politics technology and art has pushed uh, individuals towards loneliness so we are we are techno technological um uh able to to be lonely because we have telephones and and the internet and, and these kind of things so we can actually stay at home for years without seeing anyone um and you know the 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 modernist art paradigm is it, it's also problematic because it says that that that, that there is no norm so each piece of art is a completely unique expression of a, a unique individual, which resembles no other individuals, uh, which is untrue because we are not original. We are actually very banal. Uh, we, if I have an emotion, it's going to very probably uh, be very similar to one of your emotions. And that makes us able to communicate, uh, thank God. And so we need to, you know, to to uh, get rid of this, this whole ego thing and, and just, you know, just to deal with the fact that we are just a, a, a pearl on a on a long thread of, of billions of years of evolution, and the next pearl is going to come around soon, and and your pearl is going to be you know in a museum, <laughs> and that will happen soon. Um, so we need to get out of this individualistic uh, me and 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 my uh, mine, uh, and um, you know it's a funny thing like I've thought a lot about copyrights uh, these last years because copyright you know that the notion that you own a piece of art so that's a quite new phenomenon actually that this invention of copyright was some legal stunt uh, made by um, British publishers in the 18th century I think mm -hmm. uh, before that there was no copyright so everybody copied each other and nobody owned anything and and they were actually quite happy about it. You know, Bach didn't think at all who's going to steal my melody, my precious stuff, and I have to, you know, copyright it. And no, no, they didn't waste their energy with these kind of things. Because anyway, what you express is uh, the shared library of human experience, which is not yours anyway. Hmm. This, it is not yours. And I think that all these thoughts might help us to, you know, um, get out of our solitude, basically. And I'm not talking about only the horizontal solitude because we can live here and now and be, sol be, be solitary but there is also a community between you and those who don't live anymore those who are dead uh, those that lived in history these people also have a voice and the these voices live inside you and i would even be so bold um, to propose that you can also communicate with the people of the future there is um, a, a vertical consciousness that helps immensely uh, when you're coming out of the solitude because if you're con 
connected to that consciousness. And I think that when you speak about Christianity, I think that the, the cross, the, actually the, the Christian cross is actually a symbol of that. It's a symbol of the meeting point between horizontal and vertical consciousness. And in this uh, meeting point, uh, the human is, you know, uh, nailed uh, and his suffering is, is there because of it. Um, but I, I think that when you actually connect to do those two levels, you come out of your solitude anyway, because you have thousands of ancestors and you have um, thousands of um, civilizations which you carry with you, which have voices which are here and now, and which, actually which you can ask. If you have a question, you can ask them, and, and they more than often than not answer those questions. So this is getting very metaphysical. I'm sorry about that, but uh, yeah. So I, I think that the coming out of the of, of the solitude and the sense of uniqueness uh, is a way of uh, creating an environment uh, which you uh, ask for. Wow, I I don't think I can sum that up in a more uh, a beautiful way as you phrased it to be able to represent um, your perspective and. But I, I would say that uh, thinking more metaphysical about this, thinking bigger about things here um, would be something that I keep hearing that that is required for a long-term sustainable change is that we do widen our perspective uh, with time and also widen our, our world. And that is a, a big actually weakness of the modernist uh, uh, community and influence is that it is grounded so much on uh, individualism and, and this separateness. But actually a huge uh, point of uh, reason for optimism is that the classical tradition uh, would be uh, uh, is so connected to the past. And it's also, you know, we will be sustained into the future. Uh, all evidence uh, uh, supports that. Uh, and also you're then connected with universal and objective values. And you, it, so when you step into that, I think that will can really, really strengthen you as a person and, and people come together. And you also mentioned the, the field of, of flowers. So there's a, a balance between diversity and unity. There is a, this this back and forth between both of those and and we should encourage unity um i think unity is even more important than uh, uh, equality because in unity you would really need to find how we can complement each other uh, and then become one uh, but then we also have that diversity which we can see in in the creator's uh, nature and everywhere we go a great beautiful city has not a totalitarian one perfect thing all over the place there is a, a, a sense of diversity so we need different voices in different geniuses different talents and uh, you might listening right now sitting on uh, very important values uh, and very important contributions to this movement and we are hoping to uh, encourage you uh, to start to apply that uh, and and find your purpose in this uh, we will be ending here for today. I would love to talk for uh, probably two or three more hours there, Martin. I think we could uh, <laughs> enjoy that without problem. But uh, how can the audience uh, connect with your services? Well, for the moment, um, I would simply suggest uh, connect on social media. Uh, that would be the most simple thing. Um, I have a lot of plans and projects and structures coming up in the next months and years. Um, and this is in the making. Uh, so what I would propose is really simply uh, to connect on social media and uh, follow things and contribute to things as they will very certainly show up in the next months and years. Um, I will do my best to contribute um, to the developments that um, a lot of people in our generations are very sensitive of and very engaged in all of a sudden. Uh, and we need to be... Uh, aware of that thing happening uh, because nobody is alone there is there is no human phenomenon that, that is actually isolated if you have a doubt or a feeling about something you can be sure that thousands of people not all people but a lot of people will feel the same thing as yourself and so, so that's very encouraging and i i would just encourage people to to, to follow up on social media and to um, be a part of the journey Thank you very much. That is uh, Martin Romberg. Uh, so you can uh, follow him on various social media. 
uh, platforms and then you can uh, uh, learn more and, and join that meaningful contribution. Uh, so th- to our listeners, as always, we are on YouTube. Uh, we put the uh, correct subtitles so you can read and listen at the same time. That's at least how I remember things better. But you can also listen to us on the go uh, and uh, you can see some uh, uh, some teasers on Instagram to pick which episodes uh, it's most uh, uh, beneficial for you to uh, uh, accomplish your mission. So with that, have a beautiful day, everybody. And thank you so much, Martin Romberg, for joining us today. My pleasure, Magnus.